afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Friends of Copenhagen lecture in cooperation with the Tilburg University Society. My name is Diana Matroos. I'm a journalist for Dutch media, an anchor for Dutch media, like BNR News Radio and the television program Buithof. And today I will be your host. We have a very important topic today, disinformation and democracy. And it's going to be a very exciting day, also because of our special guest today, Mrs. Anne Applebaum. Thank you so much for being here. But first of all, of course, I would like to give the floor to the chairman of the board of Tilburg University. His name is Mr. Koen Becking. Give him a big round of applause. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, on behalf of the university, a special welcome to Anne. Uh, we've already met over lunch. Uh, and a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, we are here to listen to the lecture on disinformation. And um, as a political scientist, I am extra interested in the topic of the day. Um, together with uh, the Vrienden van Copenhagen, the Tilburg University Society organized this lecture. It's already the third one. Um, and we're very proud as a university to be part of all these festivities. And it's truly, truly uh, encouraging to see that, that the auditorium is so full as it is today. Very good to have you all. Um, and so we're looking forward to the lecture. Uh, the, the Friends of Copenhagen, they are working very closely together with the university uh, and the, with the new board of the Friends, uh, headed by uh, Wouter. They, have, uh, they, they are very, very ambitious. So that is very good for us as a university to, to, to know that our alumni, that the board members of our alumni association are very ambitious. And um, we are very much looking forward to the fact that um, we will realize these ambitions together, Wouter. Eh? <laughs> so um, enjoy the day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, let's see what the connection is between the, the two. I would like to invite to the stage now Wouter Schepens. He's the chairman of the Friends of the Copenhagen Institute. Give him a warm welcome. So, thank you. Welcome, well, also well, welcome. Uh, um, also, there was uh, already a remark about the the cooperation between all yes. these organizations. Can you tell something about it? Well, the the Vrienden van Kopenhagen is the, the alumni network of this uh, university. Or maybe the, um, the it's, um, a little bit higher. Yeah. I think it's uh, we had our um, 25th anniversary last year. So already for, for quite some time, um, we as alumni want to be part of the uh, Tilburg University community. We try to, be, uh, to play an active role in that. We feel ourselves as ambassadors of this university, telling uh, our colleagues, our friends, how good this university actually is. But because for, uh, I think for, for now less and less um, uh, so, but still, uh, Tilburg University used to be a little bit of a, a hidden treasure. Uh, we are here in Tilburg, which uh, I'm, I'm sure in, it is debatable amongst alumni, but this is the schoonste stad van het land. And we all know that, uh, we can debate it, uh, but still a lot of people don't, don't know that, that's uh, what we have to offer here. So that's one. And, and secondly, we organize a lot of activities for our alumni. We want to be a part of this network, yeah. uh, a, a vibrant network, organize um, uh, good meetings in a... Nice. Can I please uh, uh, take oh, the microphone gosh. for you? Yeah, you, you, you I, know I will be your assistant. <laughs> even even uh, louder. Yeah, yeah. All right. So that's that's the point. Lots of activities. A lot of people. More. Even more people. We would. We invite you all to become a member of our society because we would like to to spread this word and have more activity and uh, more diversity really in, okay. in our society. So everyone is welcome. All the alumni. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's what we want. I think that we used to have the reputation of being a little bit exclusive. 
it was a reputation. Uh, but that I think now that we want to be, we want to stay unique, but we are inclusive. We we want to have more young people on board um, uh, across all the studies of this university, uh, because we feel that enriches our organization, our our society. Uh, the the power of a network is in the diversity of its members. I'm yeah. I'm convinced of that. And, and so that is also um, uh, something that is challenging for you as a chairman to. Uh, yes. Yes, because yeah. if people look at me, they say, oh, this, again, this is the, the guy with the gray hair. Yeah. I, I still feel very young. I don't wear a tie, and I jumped on the stage. I, I hope you noticed. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I can tell you that all the board members in, 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 in our group are uh, much younger than I am. I'm the only, only gray one. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but still, I mean, yes, it is, it is a challenge to attract young people. What we also notice in, in a broader sense of society is that people are a bit reluctant to commit themselves to yeah. organizations, right? Yeah. So, um, and as we are a society of, let's say, for the members, but also by the members, and um, we want to have active members, uh, that is a, a bit of a challenge to get everybody involved and, um, and to organize activities that appeal to all our members. Yeah. Uh, but I think we're on the right track. Okay. And, and, wh and when it comes back to your personal motivation, what was your personal motivation to join? join uh, the yeah. Copenhagen, the Friends of Copenhagen? Well, um, I, I'm, I'm grateful for this university. Uh, uh, I think that I spend an, a very important part of my life here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think I, I literally, uh, or is it familiar? At least intellectually, I've grown here, yeah. which was helpful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, um, so I, I, I really feel, I'm, I'm, I feel a sense of gratitude, yeah. uh, but I also feel a sense of proud, uh, pride. I mean, this is, this is an institution that um, I don't shy away of telling the story of Tilburg University. Um, and, um, and I like to meet other alumni and to have interaction with them and to learn from others and, and to share ideas and, and to make sure that uh, this university, that we can play a little bit, a little role in, in, in building this ecosystem and helping the university to flourish. Okay, because we, have, we are living in an interesting time, of course. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it is an interesting time, and I think that universities are very important. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the speech of Anne uh, on, on uh, disinformation and democracy. That's also something that I'm, I'm concerned about, wh where we're going. And we had a very interesting um, workshop this, this, uh, before this, and, and uh, there's a, a sense of doom and gloom, and I, I hope we can give it a, a positive twist also this afternoon. Well, anyway, even if it's, it remains doom and gloom in the, in the outcome of the <laughs> presentation, we invite you all for beer and wine afterwards. Yeah, so <laughs> it will all end in a it, good it way. Will, uh, we, will, we will drink to the future anyway. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, maybe uh, uh, to reflect on this year uh, the, or the coming year, yeah. uh, are there concrete plans? Yes. What we, what we noticed, we did some research amongst the uh, alumni and we had a, an annual fee of 500 euros and, and it was, uh, we felt that it was too high. So we've decided to, to decrease that, to reduce that to uh, less than 300 for people who are 35 years and older. For people who are younger, it's even less. Um, uh, this is a bit of a sales pitch, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but in that fee, I mean, all dinner, drinks, uh, activity is included. So it's, it's really, it's a bargain. <laughs> it is a bargain. Um, and so that is a plan. I mean, this is really a means, a, a very concrete step to, to invite people to become a member, to have a, a broader membership base, more activity and more fun. Okay, and there's some uh, uh, to register. Yes, we will, we will have a flyer uh, when you leave this room. Uh, we will call you, we will hunt you down. We want you to become <laughs> a member. <laughs> so, uh, looking forward to that. Okay, uh, I would like to thank you so much. And you're going to jump down again? Choose. I'm going to, yes, I have to now. No, 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 you can also <laughs> take the stairs. <laughs> Thank Give you. him a big round of applause. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome Mr. Sylvester Eifinger, who is the chairman of the Tilburg University Society. So it's a corporation uh, today. And also is the professor of financial economics at Tilburg University. And uh, Sylvester, for me, it's really it's a personal pleasure to have you here because... <laughs> Last week, uh, you know already, I had to interview uh, the Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, uh, for an hour on live television. And I called you to have some insights regarding economic problems that we have <laughs> in the Netherlands and also in Europe. And there's a very select group I call when it comes to these important uh, interviews. So I would really like to thank you again because it helped me so much. And, uh, it was all over the news. It even went globally in the Washington Post. You, you saw? Yeah. <laughs> because he defended President Trump. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>
but I'm not here to talk about me. I'm here to introduce you so that you can introduce uh, our keynote speaker um, because you personally uh, made it happen that she's here today. Give him a big round of applause. Sylvester Eivinen. You think, why is this man walking so slowly? Uh, because I had an accident uh, almost a year ago uh, with my quadriceps, and this is the first time that I walk without a stick. So, so becoming, but the, the, the mind is young, however, the body is sometimes depreciating. That's what I can learn from this uh, episode. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Anne Applebaum. And before I introduce her, I could really recommend her webpage, which is fantastic, not only with her columns for, from the Washington Post, but other columns she writes, articles. And it gives also a very good description of what she has done, and that's very broad. Uh, Anne Applebaum is a columnist for the Washington Post. Uh, she's a historian. She is a, prize, a Pulitzer Prize winning historian. That's very special. It's also, she is also a professor of practice at the London School of Economics. We spoke about this this morning, what she's doing. She's running an institute arena, a program on disinformation in the 21st uh, century and also about you know, propaganda and these kind of things, uh, which will be the topic of our lecture, which is not disinformation and democracy, but democracy and disinformation. She's formerly a member of the Washington Post editorial board, and she also has worked as a foreign and deputy editor of The Spectator magazine, political editor of The Evening Standard, and, and that's very important, from 1988 and to 1991, when there was this yeah, Wende in, uh, in the Soviet Union and also in the East Bloc, she covered the collapse of communism as the Warsaw correspondent of the Economist magazine and the independent newspaper. Very special period. Can you imagine you're there in this midst, this turmoil where you are you know, reporting for the most, most important uh, 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 newspapers around the world. But she wrote also books. Her newest book, Red Feminine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, was published in October 2017. And uh, last year, there was a Dutch translation of her book, which was published under the title Rode Hungersnood, Stalin's Oorlog tegen Ukraine with Anmo Antos, publishers in Amsterdam. And this evening we have a dinner for the Vrienden van Copenhagen, yes. And of course, there will be also a copy of that book available for the members there. So you see how exclusive the club sometimes is. Yeah? But anyhow, that's another thing. Her previous books, which were also very special, Iron Curtain, the crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944-1956, which describes the imposition of the Soviet totalitarianism in Central Europe after the Second World War. Irene Corton won also several prizes. You know, every book of Anne wins one or more prizes. She's also the author, author of Gulag, a history, which narrates the history of the Soviet concentration camps system and describes daily life in the camps, making extensive use uh, of Russian archives. And this book, this, I think, the most famous book, uh, everybody maybe read that uh, book uh, in Dutch or in English, won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in 1994. Then, both Gulag, Iron Curtain and Gulag, a history, have appeared in 
more than two dozen translations, including major European languages. So, for example, the, both books are available in Dutch, both Iron Curtain and Gulag. And I really recommend you to read that. But more than that, and has, of course, a very dynamic life as a writer, as a historian, as a columnist, but she's also the co-author of a cookbook. Can you imagine? From a Polish country house kitchen. And that's because, of course, Anne is married to a former Polish minister who is now uh, in, uh, also doing advisory work and has also a residence in Warsaw, next to London. And maybe you have a, a penthouse or something in Washington. No, no, oh, sadly not. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Sorry, sorry. But anyhow, so um, and, uh, what is important is that um, also has uh, written over the years, you know, in the New York, New York Book Review, the Review of Books, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Financial Times, International Herald Tribune, Foreign Affairs. But most of all, most of all, she's famous for her columns in the Washington Post. I read them, everyone, and I reread them because they are so nicely composed and so strongly analytical that it's, it's a joy to read it. It's a joy to reread it. Recently, she published two important columns this week, eh? this week, this very week. Uh, first, on the 15th of January, that's about Brexit, eh? now you saw this turmoil in the House of Commons. Uh, and the title was, Theresa May Experienced a Historic Parliamentary Humiliation. That was on the 15th of January. But two days before that, there was also a column by uh, uh, Anne on the Trump-Putin revelations, tell us what we already know all along. So that was two days earlier. You see how broad she is. And if you read the columns, they're razor sharp. There are very balanced analyses from, I would say, the US perspective, the UK perspective, and the continental European perspective. I don't think many people can write these columns. She has also lectured at Yale, Harvard, Columbia Universities, as well as Oxford, Cambridge, and London. And uh, she held uh, in 90, uh, 20, uh, 2012, 2013, also a special Roman chair of history of international relations at the London School of Economics, where she's still professor of practice. Uh, and that's, of course, a, a very reputed institution. Anne was born in Washington, D.C., 1964, if I may say so. And after graduation of Yale at University, she was a Marshall Scholar at LSE and St. Anthony College in, in Oxford. And her husband, Radoslav Sikorski, is now a pol polis, uh, Polish uh, uh, politician and writer. And they have two fantastic children, which is also an effort to raise them uh, in this special turmoil time. Uh, commuting between Warsaw and London, but not always with Washington, is not easy. Sometimes I have the feeling that you write your columns in at the airplanes or in the airports. Is that true? Okay, I already guessed that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to finish. Uh, may I ask your attention for the third Vrienden van Kopenhagen lecture by Professor Anne Applebaum on democracy and disinformation. So, thank you very much. I hope you will notice that I, too, jumped onto the stage. Um, and thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, it reminds me of a very famous uh, story told by, about Henry Kissinger, um, which I confirmed is true. The story is that he was once at an event like this one, and he got up on the stage, and somebody was introducing him, and they said, and now we will hear from Dr. Kissinger, who needs no introduction. 
and he said, I'm sorry, I can't, he has a very distinct accent which I cannot imitate, but he said, I may not need an introduction, but I so enjoy them. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. Um, I was also, there was a little bit of anxiety in, that, in those introductory remarks about whether I might talk about doom and gloom. Um, there is a bit of doom and gloom in what I'm about to say, so while I'm, while I'm doing that, um, and I'll return to this at the end, I want you all to think about what this room represents. Um, and what it represents is something that um, political philosophers call civil society, meaning you are all here not because someone's paying you, not because, or maybe some of you are, I take that back, who, but, <laughs> not, no, but not because the government ordered you to be here, um, you are all here voluntarily. This is a, you're, you're, you're working as alumni, um, organizing support and promotion of a cause that you think is good, namely that of your university. Um, and these kinds of institutions, civil society institutions, are um, one of the unique and important aspects of Western democracy. And it's really this kind of institution um, and people like you who work for them who I think are going to help us get through the, the, the current crisis. So while I'm talking, keep that um, in the back of your heads. Um, and now let me, um, let me take you to a historical moment. Imagine this, imagine a moment in which suddenly everybody is an author and everybody can publish and everybody can write. And the men who had controlled access to information for a long time are suddenly now irrelevant and the establishment is crushed in a tide of new information. And new ideas multiply and conflicts are sparked and suddenly there is a series of wars. And, and the wars last for 100 years and they, they go on and on, they tear apart the continent of Europe, they, they pit people against one another, um, they, they, they cause terrible political crises everywhere. Um, no, I, that was not a little description of the present. I'm not talking about the invention of social media. I'm talking about the invention of the printing press, which was the radical 15th century technology that destabilized the church, that undermined monarchies, that brought us the Reformation. And presumably there are maybe a few people in this room who think the Reformation was good, um, maybe quite a few others who don't. Um, but it doesn't really matter wherever you are on the Protestant-Catholic split. You might also remember that the Reformation and the ensuing polarization of societies did bring us religious wars, a hundred years of them, and Christians of different kinds split into tribes and they fought for power and they burnt one another at the stake. Um, and centuries passed before Europe was at peace. Um, but if that description of the 15th century did sound a lot like the present, uh, I think there's a reason for it. Um, because I, it is my genuine belief that we're living through an equally transformative um, and equally revolutionary moment. Uh, why are so many elections in so many democracies taking surprising turns? Why are nationalists and xenophobes who sound the same suddenly uh, gaining support in countries with really different economies and different histories like Poland and the Philippines and Britain and the United States? Um, why do divisions seem so much deeper? Why is dialogue so much more difficult? Why are compromises uh, so hard to find? Well, this is my guess. And my guess is that just as the printing press broke the monopoly of the monks and the priests who controlled the written word in the 15th century, uh, the internet and the social media have in the space of really a few short years undermined not just the business model used by democratic political media for the past two centuries, but the political institutions behind them and connected to them um, as well. Um, in other words, this is a, you know, we're not just talking about a problem of fake news or, or false stories, we're talking about something that is much deeper. This is an information revolution that is affecting all um, society and all in, in many different ways. Um, let's just start with that business model. Um, I was just talking to a Dutch journalist this afternoon and, and she agreed with me. Um, if you look around the democratic world, everywhere you see large newspapers and powerful broadcasters weakening, sometimes disappearing. And with, the ex with a few exceptions in a few countries that are lucky enough to have either strong state media um, or a few strong, um, a few strong newspapers, um, the financial assumptions that have supported most of them for, a, you know, for the last century don't hold. 
um, advertisers and readers have moved to the internet. There's no model of payment that's replaced the hard copy subscriptions. But as they grow weaker, other things die too. And these old-fashioned newspapers and news organizations might have been very flawed. And I work for some of them, and I believe me, I know about that. But many of them had, nevertheless, as their founding principle, at least a theoretical commitment to objectivity and to fact-checking and to the general public interest. And these were, these were news organizations that were designed, even by their business and advertising model, to reach as many as people as possible. They sought to, to bridge gaps, to reach across society. Um, and and, and that, was their, that, was their, that was their raison d'etre. That's why they existed. Um, they also served as a filter, eliminating egregious conspiracy theories um, and fringe ideas, again, for better or for worse. Um, but more importantly, whatever you think about their objectivity or their quality um, or lack of it, they also created the possibility of a national conversation, a single debate. Um, and again, in some big European countries, um, well-funded public broadcasters still do that. But in many smaller countries, um, independent media has become very weak or has ceased to exist entirely and has instead been replaced by media which is either controlled by the government, operated by the ruling party, or else controlled by the ruling party via business groups connected to it. Um, in the United States, um, which is a very large country, there is no broadcaster or newspaper which both sides of the political spectrum consider to be neutral and which both sides accept as authoritative. Um, what is the result of this is polarization. People choose sides, they move apart, the center disappears, and polarization has other side effects. Um, so in many democracies, including the United States, there is now no common debate, let alone a common narrative. And this is not a question of people having different opinions or different biases or different political interests. Um, people don't actually have the same facts. So one group thinks one set of things is true, another believes in something quite different, and we, are, we find ourselves arguing not about the way to move forward, but about what happened yesterday. Um, social media, we all know now, I think it accelerates and accentuates this phenomenon because it allows people, and indeed its algorithms sometimes force people, to see only the news and opinion that they want to hear, whether it's factual or not. So the algorithms that reinforce comforting narratives have created homogenous clusters online, otherwise sometimes known as echo chambers or filter bubbles. Um, what that means in, in, in plain ang language is that people get their news from their close-knit, ideologically similar friends whom they trust. Most members of an echo chamber share the same prevailing worldview and they interpret news through a common lens. But this deeper polarization has other effects. For example, it creates distrust for what used to be considered neutral or apolitical institutions. This is the civil service, the police, the judiciary, government-run bodies of all kinds now fall under suspicion because one side or the other, or sometimes both, suspects that they have been captured by the opposing party. Um, this, this, this new suspicion also has had a lethal effect on traditional political parties. Um, these were once based on real-life organizations like trade unions or the church, but now instead of looking to real organizations, more and more people now identify with groups or organizations or just ideas and themes that they find online in the virtual world. So people can reach across traditional social and geographic lines to form interest groups in ways that undermine traditional politics, but both for the better and for the worse. Um, these new parties that succeed in converting virtual support into real votes um, do so because they've taken advantage of this change. And one thinks of Macron's En Marche or the very different Italian Five Star Movement or indeed the Gilets Jaunes Movement, whatever you can call it, uh, happening in France now. Um, in many places, though, this, this, I mean, this may be one of them, um, this phenomenon has also led to deeper fragmentation, so, and again, increased partition. So groups, grouplets, hunker down, they barricade themselves into ideological ghettos, and they aren't worrying anymore about the general interest. Um, and that observation leads naturally to a, a, a more central point, which is that this new information network, with its kind of deep divides and its suspicious clans, 
is also far more conducive than the old one was to the spread of false rumors, whether generated naturally or imposed from outside, and to campaigns of either insider or outsider manipulation. Um, to put it bluntly, and this, is, this has been proved in several different studies and surveys, um, people who live in highly partisan echo chambers are much more likely to believe false information if they receive it from highly partisan sources that they trust. So the more partisan and the more polarized, the more susceptible to conspiracy theories, to disinformation campaigns and false information. And this, of course, is a weakness that can be exploited. Um, in due course, many people are going to exploit it. Um, but since we're, you know, we're all aware of news from the United States, whether we um, want to be or not, um, it's worth pointing out that the first national government to understand how this new system worked was the Russian government. Um, we now know that in the US election, professional Russian trolls deliberately sought out partisans. In other words, they looked for those alienated groups online, um, ranging from anti-immigration groups who were pro-Trump to Black Lives Matter activists. They also created uh, fake, um, fake anti-Trump groups um, whom they targeted um, in an effort to get them to not vote for Hillary Clinton. In other words, they targeted people with false information both either to get them to vote for Trump or to stop voting for Clinton. Um, in a couple of instances, they even sought to use fake Facebook pages to organize real events, protest marches, even orchestrated clashes between different groups. Um, as we now know, this kind of activity was combined with a more traditional form of cyber attack, the hack of the Democratic National Committee, uh, material from which was spun into hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of stories, ranging from, I don't know, Democrats are anti-Catholic, that was one strand, um, to Hillary Clinton runs a pedophile ring in the basement of a Washington, D.C. pizza restaurant. Um, you laugh, but that, that famous um, conspiracy theory known as Pizzagate um, inspired um, one man who lived in North Carolina to get in his pickup truck, drive to Washington with his gun, go into the pizza restaurant, break down the door, shoot his gun into the air, and say, where are the, where are the children that you've hidden, that you've kidnapped? And the, the pizza restaurants, you know, oh, where, they're in the basement. And the pizza restaurant said, we didn't have a basement. Um, and there was, of course, nothing there. And he, interestingly, apparently felt very abashed and embarrassed um, before he went to jail. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, the, the um, you know, each one of these groups can run Twitter campaigns that promote particular memes and hashtags in order to make these ideas seem more popular. And actually, there was a Russian involvement, we now know, in Pizzagate, in kind of supporting and making, making um, posts on Facebook and so on seem more popular than they were. Um, you know, particular messages were amplified by the use of bots. Um, as the younger people in this room know, but maybe some older ones might not, these are bits of computer code that can be programmed to imitate human social media accounts and can pass on particular stories. Uh, many millions of them now operate on all of the social media proper platforms um, um, where they're used for all kinds of things, but among other things to distort reality, to make particular ideas trend and seem popular and to make particular narratives um, see, seem, seem as if more people are reading them as well. Um, these tactics are now widely used across Europe as well, although I don't think the awareness here of how they work is as widespread. Uh, during the German elections last year, um, I took part in a data analysis project at the London School of Economics, and we found plenty of evidence actually of all these tactics which in Germany were aimed at boosting the support um, both real and fake, of the Alternative for Deutschland, or AFD, which is Germany's far-right party. Um, Pro-Russian media and Russian trolls working hand-in-hand, -hand, I must say, with the international alt-right, which now also operates online, you don't have to be Russian to do this, um, spent the months before the election echoing and repeating divisive messages, anti-immigration, anti-NATO, pro-Russian, and of course pro-AFD. They targeted very specific groups, they targeted people who are already on the German far-right, um, they targeted the Russian-speaking community in Germany, which is much bigger than you think, thanks to immigration from the former USSR, it's several million people, um, and to some extent the far left too. And the point was um, they were trying to drive as many people as possible into echo chambers where they would hear the same messages over and over again, um, some true and some false, um, and, and in, in order to motivate them either to vote or not to vote. Um, depending on, on which the group 
was. Um, I haven't myself worked on the Dutch internet, um, but I know that uh, I know that similar studies have been done here. It's a very similar pattern, um, and I will contribute an observation from a friend who follows Russian bots in the United States, um, who very often finds Dutch accounts echoing Russian accounts in the U.S. context. You know, just in case you had any doubt that globalization is real. So, um, for anyone who's been following. Russian use of the internet in Central and Eastern Europe, um, these US election tactics were nothing new. Um, sponsoring extremism is something that the Russian state, like the Soviet state before it, has been doing for many years. Kind of throwing compromise or secret material into the public space um, is an old fact tactic. Um, governments in Hungary, Slovakia, Macedonia, and Poland, among others, have also been brought down by secret tapes or leaks like the ones used in the US election. Um, as in the U.S. election, this so-called secret information was often spun into hundreds of conspiracy theories that net may have borne no relation to the original text. Um, online disinformation campaigns involving fake websites or fake photographs or fake stories have long been used to great effect in Ukraine as well, of course. Um, maybe that's why, having followed politics in Eastern Europe for many years, when I watched the US election unfold in 2016, I had this very clear sense of deja vu. Um, maybe here is where I should confess that I have a personal interest in Russian disinformation campaigns. Um, a couple of years ago, I was the focus of one of them. Um, it had some very interesting spy novel elements. Um, there was an Australian journalist who began writing about me. He had actually fled the United States in the 1980s following an FBI inquiry into his KGB connections. And by some accounts, he was the last, um, he was the last KGB recruit in Washington. Um, he was never very important, but he had some minor job in the, in the US government. But when he began writing about me more recently, his technique was much more up to date. Um, he wrote articles containing a mix of truth and lies. You know, my book contract and my, you know, was described as mysterious income from questionable sources you know, maybe the CIA, um, he posted this, this material on these quasi-serious Russian business websites, and then he let others do the rest, and I, I, it was very eye-opening. I watched the stories move around through a kind of system that I realized had been constructed for this purpose. So eventually these articles were echoed or quoted in a dozen places. So other websites with ties to Russian business um, on Russia Today, um, on the website of an, the American Libertarian, Ron Paul, um, in the comment sections of Polish newspapers. Um, and this trickle continued until months later, WikiLeaks, uh, in November 2015, um, well before the organization became notorious for its role in the US election, tweeted one of these articles to Julian Assange's four million followers. Um, it was very unnerving. But it was also very educational and very interesting because as I watched the story move around, I saw how this world of fake websites and fake information exists to reinforce one another and give falsehood credence. You know, many of the websites quoted not the original source but one another. There were a lot more of them than I had realized. Um, though I also learned that many of their followers, maybe even most of them, were fake. Um, they were also bots. Um, in my case, it also turned out not to really matter. Um, most of the people I know and encountered in my life have never read any of these stories. They live in a different, um, in a different part of the internet, and they didn't see them. And also, I'm, you know, not that important enough, you know, for for it to really matter. And I just had to learn not to care about this particular disinformation campaign. Just as I've had to learn, we all learn, I think now, not to care about all kinds of other things about me and my friends and places that I care about that are said online. Um, my point is different, namely that these systems have been in place for a while, that the production of false stories relies on entire ecosystems, that those who created them are constantly updated, updating them, and that it's time we tried to understand them better. Um, they are not confined to electoral politics or electoral years. Um, botnets, you know, these groups of bots that are linked together, can be used in a lot of ways, even when nobody's voting, and repurposed. Um, amusingly, our German project discovered a commercial botnet based in Nizhny Novgorod in Russia, which promoted the AFD, as well as escorts in Dubai, <laughs> car advertisements, 
um, and material attacking Alexei Navalny, who's the Russian anti-corruption activist. Um, other studies have revealed how the exact same trolls used to promote Trump were turned around a few months later to attack Emmanuel Macron. Um, in other words, these are often commercial operations. You can rent them. You know, you can say, you, know, you can ask a botnet to do X or Y and it will do it. Um, it's also important to understand that it can take other forms, disinformation. Last, a, a, few, a few years ago, the US Defense Department um, uncovered a Russian effort to hijack more than 10,000 Twitter users at the Pentagon. Message were, messages were sent linking to stories about sporting events or celebrities. When you clicked them, the links took users to a Russian-controlled server. Um, it downloaded a program that allowed Moscow's hackers to take control of the victim's Twitter account. So this scheme was rumbled. It was, found, it was discovered. But think about what might have happened if it had succeeded. So imagine the chaos that could be unleashed if authentic Defense Department social media accounts with the authority of the U.S. Armed Forces behind them began tweeting disinformation. You know, what if this happened during a natural disaster? Or what if it happened during a terrorist attack? You know, what if the terrorist attack was begun deliberately and the disinformation campaign planned in advance to go with it? Um, as each tweet backed up the others and covert Russian agents amplified the messages, you know, the result could be real panic um, or confusion. Um, nor do you need the Defense Department to be the only target. As I've said, we now know that Russian trolls created both Facebook and Twitter accounts that pretended to be um, anti-immigration activists in Idaho, as well as Black Lives Matters activists in, 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 on the East Coast. You know, what if these were commandeered at a crucial moment? For example, during a race riot or at a moment of political unrest. You know, couldn't they be used to increase anxiety and fear? And might that not have long-term political effects as well? Now, all these examples I've cited are Russian, um, but of course that is misleading. Uh, Russia is simply ahead of this game. They just were, got interested in it before others did. Um, for historical reasons, the Russian secret services understood the possibilities of internet disinformation before anyone else. Um, in the Soviet era, the KGB had whole departments devoted to what we now call fake news, famously spreading not just Soviet propaganda, but also, for example, a very famous rumor that the CIA had deliberately invented the AIDS virus. Um, now you laugh. It was, a, it was a big story. It appeared in multiple newspapers all over the world. Um, the U.S., um, you know, some, this, was, this was very late in the day. This was in the 1980s, and the U.S. was at that time speaking to the Soviet Union. At one point, there was even a threat made, we will do no more scientific cooperation with you unless you stop this rumor. So it was, a, it was considered a big deal at the time. Um, Soviet Union is now gone, of course. But there are also reasons why the KGB's descendants have devoted so much time to thinking about this in the present. It's a very cheap way for an impoverished ex-superpower to meddle in other countries' politics. Um, moreover, the Russians have a direct interest in weakening and dividing Western democracies, um, more so than most. Um, I, you know, this is a, you know, this is for a, someday for a longer conversation, but the Russian interest in undermining the West is both practical and ideological. Um, on the, you know, what, the, what Russia fears about the West, or what the Kremlin fears, rather, is not our tanks, you know, or our soldiers. What they're really afraid of is the power of democracy rhetoric. Um, this is something that Putin saw himself in, when he was in East Germany in 1989. Um, it's what they saw in Ukraine in 2014 when people were waving EU flags and chanting anti-corruption slogans. Um, this kind of event, this kind of revolution is what he is afraid of, and so um, th the easiest way for him to fight it is to undermine the systems, both in the eyes of Russians in particular, but also in the eyes of people who live in this, in this, in this part of the world. So it is, a, it is absolutely an ideological and political strategy. We don't want to you know, we would like to undermine what the West is and what it stands for so that it doesn't become attractive um, to Russians. Um, but although the Russians were the first to invest in these things, um, others will follow them and are already doing so. Um, the Trump campaign's means of campaigning in the U.S. wasn't that different um, from what the Russians were doing anyway. Um, other governments might do it. 
political parties, private companies. Um, somebody recently described the recent uh, Mexican election to me as a bot war with no rules of engagement. Um, almost every group in Mexican politics was creating botnets to fight against the others. You know, there's no big bar to entry into this game. It doesn't cost very much, um, certainly relative to, to creating weapons, real weapons. It doesn't take very much time. It's not particularly high tech, uh, and it requires no special equipment. Um, now, I can imagine what you're thinking now. Um, if only we could stop this from happening. If only somebody was in charge of stopping disinformation campaigns, I don't know, supporting the traditional press and fixing the partisan divides. Uh, and here we come to the black hole at the heart of the problem, which is that nobody is responsible for solving it. Democratic governments don't censor the internet. They aren't in the habit, right yet, or right now, of funding independent media. Um, and of course, if they did, it would cease to be independent. Um, the militaries of, I don't know, France or the Netherlands or the US are not set up to fight information wars. Um, NATO can control tanks, but it is not going to wade into the social media wars that go on in its own member states. Um, even counterintelligence services are very queasy about taking part in political debates inside their own countries. You know, it, isn't, it just isn't their job to you know, penetrate echo chambers, to counter conspiracy theories, or to bring back trust to democratic institutions, let alone to reinvigorate the traditional press. But if public institutions can't do it, if military institutions can't do it, and tech companies won't do it, um, then who can? Um, and the answer is going to be unsatisfying because I don't think that there is one silver bullet solution. Um, there may be some clues from the past. Um, as, you know, as, as I've said, the 1980s, we, we know in the past, were also a kind of high point for disinformation um, in response to, for example, the CIA had invented the AIDS virus story, the Reagan administration created something called the Active Measures Working Group, a kind of interagency group that brought together a wide range of people, you know, from the CIA to the United States Information Agency. Today's equivalent might be a European-wide body with a similarly broad range, perhaps including tech companies, academic institutions like this one, uh, media, civil society, civil society, and policymakers. Maybe together they can again define the disinformation agenda, create tools and bodies that can track it empirically and transparently and push back strategically. Um, more research and analysis is also part of the answer. Um, but again, some of, the, but some of the solution may also lie inside the tech platforms themselves. You know, imagine what could be achieved, for example, if the major internet platforms could be persuaded that the world they are helping to create is not one that will be conducive to the work that they do? Um, what if they could be persuaded, for example, to cooperate on the issue of online anonymity? You know, without question, anonymity on Twitter, on Reddit, um, in comment sections of newspapers, gives almost complete freedom to people who are driven by bile or greed or ideology. You know, in real life, we are all suspicious of people who cover their faces online. I mean, who cover their faces in real life. If somebody walked in the room right now with a mask on, um, we would not necessarily accept them into the group. We would be, we would be made nervous of them, by them. Um, you know, perhaps online, you should also have to prove who you are before you enjoy the full protection of the law. You know, if tech platforms wanted to do so, they could create ways for people to prove they are real without necessarily revealing their identities to all and sundry. You know, we should, we should be able to back up our email and social media accounts with other credentials, with bank details, phone numbers, addresses, um, government-issued identities. You know, we don't need to give the actual details of these to tech giants. We just need the custodians of our data to issue an electronic token confirming that we want to use one identity to back up another. Um, some systems for authenticating online identity exist already. For example, um, Twitter issues a little blue tick. You get a little check mark to accounts that it regards as verified, um, although its criteria are opaque and it's pretty arbitrary who gets to be verified, and Facebook has a similar scheme. You know, what about making verification a right and not a privilege? So why can't everybody have a little blue check mark? Um, and this would at least tilt the scales in favor of real people. 
You know, most people, people might choose to only read emails and engage on social media with authenticated accounts that belong to real people. You know, just like we like to know the names of real life people before we dispense most of our time and trust on them. Um, that would at least raise the tone of discussion and make it harder for outsiders to interfere. Um, tech companies drag their feet on this because vast numbers of their accounts are fake. Um, perhaps 20% in the case of Facebook and maybe up to half on Twitter. Um, but if the tech companies won't do it, maybe governments should. You know, in Estonia, the government has created a system that gives every resident of the country an online identity, a totally secure passport that gives them both rights and responsibilities online. What if the European Union were to offer the possibility of e-citizenship to every European? You know, what if social media platforms were to require participants to have this kind of online identity um, before they participate? Um, I'm just throwing out some ideas. Um, uh, you know, I think this is a this is an area where there's a huge possibility for creativity. Um, you know, what I would like to avoid is a situation where either Facebook or the Dutch government takes it upon itself to begin censoring online communities because um, you know we see that's begun already. Um, it's not very successful. Um, it creates a pushback. Um, maybe there are more fundamental things we can do to the structure of the internet to make it to to make it less chaotic. Um, you know, in, in in other countries, I've heard of people calling for social media advertising to be regulated the same way that advertising is regulated in other spaces. Um, you know, why is it that people who put a make a political billboard have to follow certain laws, whereas people who make a political ad on Facebook don't? It makes no sense. Um, German government has now made Facebook liable for material that appears on its site in Germany, um, for material that violates the country's, their laws on extremist speech. That's not going to work for everybody. Not everybody has Germany's laws. But in country by country, I think we could be creative in thinking about how to do this. You know, the counter argument is that regulation won't work, that the platforms and the internet more generally are changing too fast. Um, although a British uh, politician of my acquaintance recently reminded me that in the 19th century, the laws that established protection for factory workers during the Industrial Revolution were also written in waves, and they were also written, altered over time to suit changing technology. Um, capital markets, which is an equally complex, equally fast-moving world, you know, the world of financial, you know, somehow we managed to regulate that too, um, even though it's absolutely packed with people who are trying to cheat and who, and who you know, could make fantastic amount of monies by doing so. Nevertheless, there's a regulation that works. Why can't social media be regulated as well? Um, not censored, regulated. Um, some of the work I've done in recent months at LSE um, suggests some other possibilities. Um, what if, for example, we start from the assumption that people who live in highly partisan echo chambers um, reject standard attempts at fact-checking. And so what if journalists try to read them, reach them in different ways? Um, we're running an experiment with some Italian computer scientists and an Italian newspaper, um, which is going to try and find different ways using narratives and different graphics and different authority figures to try and reach especially distrustful audience on the topic of migration. Um, finally, part of the answer odd though it sounds, is you. Uh, and by that, I don't mean you as members of the Alumni Association of Tilburg University, um, but I mean, or, or, or you as academics, um, I mean you as citizens. Because it's going to be very important over the next several years and even decades for the inhabitants of democracies to find ways of, of influencing and changing the new forms of media that might capture the hearts and minds of voters and not just their attention. Um, it may be that everybody has to find ways to teach children to be literate in the 21st century or else indeed to teach university students um, in order to help people learn to distinguish propaganda from real stories on the internet. Um, everybody might find they have to interact with politicians and with judges and with civil servants in new ways um, and all of us might find ourselves participating more in public life than we used to. Um, the analogy that I like to use is to water. So all of us right now have running water. It comes out of the tap, we turn it on, it comes out, 
We don't spend any time thinking about where the water comes from. Is it clean? Who cleans it? What does it cost? It just comes out of the tap and we drink it. Um, and we're used to that, and the way in which we're used to running water is the same way in which we're used to our democracies. It just works. You vote every four years or every five years, and you get a politician, and maybe it's better or worse, but whatever, it, 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 it goes on. We might have to start thinking a little bit more um, the way that people who live in African villages with no water think about water. Where does it come from? How do I get it? How do I bring it to my house in the morning? How do I make sure I have enough throughout the day? Um, democracy might stop being something that's automatic, that we can assume is always going to be there, and it may be that we all need to begin to think about how we um, enhance it. Do we join parties? Do we join associations? Do we become active readers of the media? Do we? Somebody behind me just now um, asked what should be done to help independent media, and I said, you should buy a newspaper. And he said, oh, no, I buy a newspaper. And I said, no, 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 I don't mean buy a newspaper at the kiosk. I mean buy the newspaper, buy the institution. You know, you, you know, one new form of philanthropy may have to be local newspapers. Um, they may be, they don't survive anymore. Um, I mean, the, you know, Dutch public television will always be fine. NRC handles blot will always be fine. But local newspapers might not be fine, and it may be that they need to have new sources of funding, perhaps philanthropic, um, perhaps through foundations, and we, we all might need to be thinking about that. Um, look, you know, the revival of democracy, which has for so long been dependent on reliable information and on information that reaches everybody, um, in an era of unreliable information, is going to be a major civilizational project. You know, just like it took hundreds of years to end the religious wars in Europe, it may take some time before the real solutions to this problem um, are found too. Um, at the end of the day, I think we have to hope that the very basic human desire not to be fooled uh, wins the day. Um, also that the deeper values of democracy, the principles of tolerance, respect for rule of law, the importance of strong and neutral political institutions, we have to hope that these prove stronger than the inchoate and dissatisfied anger that you often found, we often find online. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for your inspiring insights. It's a very interesting topic, uh, like we said uh, earlier. Uh, uh, we're going to invite some panel members and also have interaction with the audience, but just a few questions to, to start us off. What is your biggest worry when it comes to... That wasn't enough? No. Yeah, <laughs> it was a lot, but <laughs> I'm so curious, what your, what's your biggest worry? My, my biggest worry is that we, we don't deal with the problem, you know, while in time. Yeah. I mean, that it that isn't understood, that it's, uh, that, it's um, that, that people don't take these things seriously. That's my biggest worry. Because we see a lot and we don't act on it. We see a lot, we don't act on it. And as I said, it is this, this running water analogy is real. You know, we just assume everything is going to go on the way it is just because that's how it does. Um, until the moment when it stops. And I, I would like us to think about the problems before we get to that moment. Okay. Uh, you uh, had some uh, comparison with uh, uh, transitions when it comes to information earlier, years ago, when the printed press was uh, invented. And when we uh, compare it to now, are there some learnings then that, we, that can help us to solve the problems nowadays? I feel like somewhere in this audience there is a student of the religious wars in Europe, who could probably answer that question better than me. Um, <laughs> but some, some, you know, some piece of it has looks, so how, did, how and why did those wars eventually end? They ended, you know, this is, please forgive me historians, this is really very general, but kind of more or less they end when ideas of religious tolerance and the idea of the neutral state and, you know, and the, and the, and the enlightenment make it possible for people to live together in one society. So some, some, new, um, you know, some, some new set of agreements or some new set of agreements about how we live and how we communicate will eventually emerge. I also saw a, a lecture of you and then you were also talking about the transition when the radio was invented. Yes, so this is a, so, the, you know, I've, I've, I mean, really almost every moment in history when there's a big change in the way that people get information, there's a political impact. And the, 
um, the, the, what the, the other recent one that's very important was the moment when radio was invented. Um, and the invention of radio, the first two people who really understood radio and who understood how it was different from the news and how it could reach a different kind of audience uh, were Hitler and Stalin. Um, and they both used the radio brilliantly. They understood what its impact could be. Having somebody's voice in your room was different from reading it in a, in a press. And they both, um, they both used it. And the, the responses to radio were interesting. One of them was the BBC. Um, the BBC was created as a, um, with the idea that we need some kind of radio that reaches everybody. And literally, it was the, the idea that we have everybody in one conversation. So there's BBC Wales and BBC Scotland. and. BBC Cornwall and um, BBC is meant to reach young people and old people and so on. It still actually has that mission to this day. Um, uh, um, it's, I wouldn't say it's entire, still entirely successful, but it's by comparison to others, it's, it still functions um, in, that, in that way. People, everybody will appear on the BBC, whereas not everybody in the United States will appear on Fox News. You know, and not everybody will appear yeah. on CNN. So it's yeah. a, it still, it still has that function. Another. Another response, um, the other great user of radio was Franklin Roosevelt, um, who, who created the idea of the fireside chat. So instead of using radio as this sort of aggressive language, you know, in your living room, it was avuncular, you know, friendly, come into, my, come into the White House and sit and talk to me. He also was, a, was very good at radio. Maybe there are some examples from Dutch history that you can, you can tell me as well. But learning, learning how to live with it, use it, um, getting people used to it, um, yeah. made a big difference. Uh, we have a lot of uh, transitions. Uh, of course, you are a historian, but w when we uh, take a small step into the future, um, is there also a worry about next steps that are coming, like uh, voice cloning maybe? Yes. So this is a, partly because it's, um, you know, that's a, it's, you know, maybe farther away than we think. The, the one of the great fears now is the, is fake video. Um, and um, what's called deep fakes. In other words, you know, somebody might be able to take an image of you speaking and make, your, make it seem as if you're saying something completely different, you know, yeah. or me. Yeah. You know, and in the case of me saying something completely different, you know, it's not really that cataclysmic, you know, maybe it's a but problem it's for the me. the prime minister. But what if it's the prime minister, or what if it's the, you know, the commander in chief, you know, or what if it's the the general, you know, in on the ground in Syria or something, you know. So, w um, what if you could make the president seem to be saying something that he never said, and then it becomes passed around? And this is a, this is this is a possibility. It's already work, it is it is possible. It's getting closer, um, and the you know the the I think the answer Susan to that is going to be something technical. In other words, um, the 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 creation of tags or something that will allow you to see that video has been manipulated. That you know. But, but it's a, I don't know, there, there, there are some people who say this is going to be happening next week, and there's some people who say it's only 10 years from now, so, you know. Okay, okay. So you don't, maybe you don't have to worry. No. <laughs> well, I worry about no, it. No, but these also, kind of, also, but also also you know, deep, faking, faking yeah. video, faking sound, fake, well, I mean, we can already fake pictures, yeah. you know, so, so Photoshop is already with us. Um, although if you think about it, I mean, people, n once people knew that there was Photoshop, and people are now more aware of what Photoshop is. I mean, there's a, you know, I now, if I look at a picture that seems odd, I, I ask myself whether that's, you know. Yeah. Um, and so it may also be with all these things that we also begin to develop antibodies, you know. I, the danger, of course, um, the danger is that sooner or later, nobody believes anything. Yeah. Um, and if, you know, if you don't believe any video or, you, or anything that you see. Then we written, have a big problem. Then, yeah. you, then you have a, a, a problem having uh, not just democratic politics, but really almost any politics. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to invite you to take a seat. Thank you. And uh, in the meantime, I would like to, uh, to have some people on stage. And their names are Anita van Os, Martijn de Kort, Bauke Dynema, and Erik Koster. Give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Come on the stage. Because, as you know, uh, earlier this day, there were a few sessions uh, which you also participate. And uh, from each session, oh, they're going to move the tables a little bit uh, to the front of the stage so that uh, we have some uh, better contact. 
Uh, while they are moving, um, there were four sessions, and uh, from each session, we have a panel member that has some questions regarding the discussion that was uh, been there earlier this day. Um, regarding the audience, we have two microphones uh, in the room. Yes, the colleagues there are at the back of the room. So if you want to say something, make a remark, have a question uh, also for expert uh, today, our keynote speaker, Anne Applebaum, please stand up and briefly introduce yourself. When you stand up and I will ask the mic uh, to come to you, then you can briefly introduce yourself and then ask your question. This will all be in English, of course. Okay, while everyone is uh, seated, <laughs> take a seat, please. Uh, and also you uh, asked me that it's very important for you to also know the views that are here in this room present today. Yes, if we're gonna spend the afternoon me answering questions, it will be very boring for me because I, I already know <laughs> what I think. Yeah. yeah so, so I'm really interested to know what you think. So. Yeah. Are there maybe some <laughs> specific questions that you're very interested in when it comes to uh, well, all the Dutch people that are here present? I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear the Dutch version of what I just was discussing. How are you dealing with these issues here? Each, you know, it is a, because the context is slightly different, every country has slightly different media and different relationships between institutions. Everybody's coming up with different answers and I'd love to hear what you think is okay. happening here. So uh, please uh, make her wish happen and also give your views uh, regarding how we are coping with this uh, problem. Uh, first of all, we have uh, two mics uh, on the table for the four uh, panel members. I will start uh, here. Uh, maybe you can uh, share the mic uh, over there. Maybe uh, everyone can briefly introduce themselves, your name and what you're uh, doing in daily life and your uh, uh, interest in the subject of today. Can you please yep. start? Yes. Sure. Um, my name is Bauke Dynema. Uh, I'm a student here in Tilburg, uh, but I live in Utrecht, where I did my bachelor degree. And from um, this year on, I'm starting my master's degree in uh, business communication and digital media. So uh, the name media is in the, the title itself already. Uh, and also during my bachelor, it was a pretty critical view on uh, information and media uh, very broadly. So. Um, yeah, from Utrecht on, I started having a critical view on, uh, on a lot of things we hear from politicians and from science and from basically everyone, which is sometimes a bit scary. You have to, uh, to, to, um, yeah. Yeah, to, to live with it, of course. Okay, so. thank you for now. Uh, we will be back uh, uh, regarding your session. Maybe I can ask you to introduce yourself now briefly. Definitely. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Koster. I've been a student here in the uh, University of Tilburg, uh, the class of 20, 2006, I think. I'm a lawyer by profession, so uh, one disclaimer, I'll try to keep it short uh, as possible, but uh, <laughs> uh, so I'll have... Well, may, maybe your uh, uh, personal interest but regarding the subject it, of today. Of course, I'm a lawyer, so that means my, my, my daily uh, work is just focusing on fact-checking, basically, because the, the rules and the regulations, and I'm actually in favor of regulations. Uh, uh, given my profession, but uh, you know, it's already in my files. In my, in my case, I usually see that you know the counterparty and and my party uh, we're checking the same fact, however we interpret it differently. So uh, even if you have clarity on what's the actual fact, you still can have a dispute about what's the consequence thereof. Sure, so that normal. makes it more difficult. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. My name is uh, Anita van Os. I'm consultant and member of advisory boards. Uh, and with regard to my interest in this uh, subject, I think what is happening, the developments have so such a huge impact that for me it's unbelievable that you are not interested in this uh, subject. <laughs> <laughs> it affects all of us. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm Martijn de Kort, uh, class of 2002, international business. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a politician on the state level here in uh, North The Island. provincial states? Yes. Yes, for uh, which party? Uh, the Labour Party Social Democrats. Okay, thank you uh, so much. And I uh, read somewhere that you really believe in an equal society. And when it comes to uh, disinformation and democracy, what's your view on that? 
It, it should, it yeah, should, yeah, yeah, for you, yeah. It should affect well. everybody in an equal way. <laughs> well, maybe, yes, also, right. maybe also because you were at uh, the, the first uh, session uh, that we're now uh, uh, debating, uh, also with the audience, of course, and with you all four present, but you were there. Uh, does information inform climate policies? You were there. What, what were the highlights during the discussion? Well, we, we, we had a very interesting presentation. Um, and, and, and the interesting part about it is, scientifically, there is so much information on climate change. But we saw that there's not just a problem that a lot of people don't act, there's also the problem that, uh, and, and I think there was an eye-opener for most people in the group, even when we have a scientific report by the IPCC in this case, <laughs> the translation of the huge report into the summary that is actually used by policymakers is done by politicians. Countries had to unanimously agree on the summary of a scientific report. And we were shown which parts were left out. Parts that didn't fit with, uh, in this case, ideas of China and Brazil, because it didn't help their negotiating position. So I think that was one of the most, for me, and I heard from a lot of other people in the group, one they of the most shocked. shocking aspects, yeah. that the summaries of scientific research are decided upon by politicians in this case. Yeah. And the, the, the class was uh, moderated by uh, Professor Raya Gerlach, uh, and also he's connected to the IPCC. That's correct, huh? Yeah. Uh, what, what was your question regarding to the session to <laughs> Anne Applebaum? What I, um, what I really wonder is how can we... You told us about how people live in their own echo chamber nowadays. And, and we see that, uh, you told us how important it is that you have m news outlets that are neutral, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, in the US, it's now either you're on this side or you're on that side, and you have the news channel that matches that. You gave examples of, 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 of for example, the Netherlands, where you do have some independent media. Um, what I see is that in discussions that I have online, mm -hmm. for example, on climate change, um, I try to listen to people's fears. I try to, to, to really seriously go into debate with them. And, and I also try to inform by not giving information from my party because I understand that they think that's biased, but by quoting uh, the national newspapers, by quoting the national television channels. And the response I get work. nine out of 10 times is fake news. Right. Um, so even those <laughs> neutral news channels have already been, been, been well, hit by this Very fake news so. yeah, yeah. well, idea that Trump and others put in, 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 into the minds of people. So how can, we, how can you deal with people that are so stuck in their echo chambers that even news by, in, in the Netherlands, the NOS, the Volkskrant, Algemeen Dagblad, is being counted immediately as fake news? Yeah. Well, th no, that, that is, um, that's the main question. I mean, you have the... Um, the, the, you know, people now treat e maybe even particularly those institutions as somehow biased or belonging somehow to the other side. I mean, so there's a lot of work has been done studying um, how, how and why people accept and reject information. Um, and the best thing I can say, and this is, you know, we're at a very kind of primitive stage of understanding this, is you have to figure out what it is that will make people trust you, or not so much you, but will make people trust that information. So does it depend on who it comes from? Does it depend on what it looks like? Does it depend on what form it takes? For example, I mean, and th this may be something that takes, it's worth maybe your party experimenting with, you know, if you communicate, I don't know, just figures and data to people, do they accept that or do they reject it? If you communicate in the form of narrative stories, do they accept that or do they reject it? Um, which are the, um, you, know, you know, which are the means of telling the story or presenting the information can you give people? And it may also be that the answer is not the same across populations. Um, one of the things that um, Facebook has done, whether we like it or not, is it has sort of, it has made it possible to, um, you know, to kind of identify different groups online. And it may be now that it's no longer possible for your party, for example, or for a newspaper to just give out one message. Maybe you need several messages. Maybe you need to reach different kinds of people in different ways. Um, 
you know, I didn't have any, you know, and this is something that, you know, once you begin thinking like that, what's the way to reach this kind of person, um, then maybe you get to some kind of answer. I'm sorry, it's not very helpful, but it's a, well, <laughs> but it's a, kind of, it's a kind of beginning of it. It's not so much you have to listen to me because I'm right and the scientists and I have scientific facts. What is, you know, you have to think, you have to kind of switch the way of arguing, thinking what is it that people will, will hear? What is it? Because it's the, the, at the end of the day, it's, a, it's about trust. Why do people trust some sources and not other sources? Okay. So you have to know different ways how to... Maybe, uh, may, maybe just beginning to think like that might help. That's my only... Okay. You want to reflect well, on Well, yeah. The, in, in a way, that's, that is what, what, what marketing does. <laughs> it, you you identify this, different target groups from, and you adapt your message to, to, to the different target groups. So Facebook I think was created for marketers. I mean, it, you know, it, this is exactly... I mean, it is well, very and, much... And, and Trump is a master marketer. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and this is, of course, how the, how the Trump campaign did it. You know, this is actually how the Russians did their advertising campaign in the U.S. is they had different messages for different groups. And as I said, they had messages to you know, radical black socialists saying, don't vote for Hillary Clinton, she's not left-wing enough, you know, and they had a different message for people in Idaho. So that, that is exactly how they think. So maybe there's a count, maybe there's a, we have to think like that too. Maybe there are some questions already in the room or some uh, remarks, some views that you want to share with us, how we can cope with this. Someone, yeah, can you please stand up? Yes. <laughs> and the mic is coming. Uh, wh where's the mic, please? Help me out. <laughs> you have to run, I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, briefly introduce yourself and then uh, please your remark or question. Uh, first of all, Jean Dobre. Jean Dobre. And uh, <laughs> my name is Maciej. I study here second year liberal arts and sciences on Tilburg University College. And what I wanted to ask about is. Uh, that, of course, we're talking about how people are susceptible to fake news and such. However, in the countries that were hit the hardest by, uh, well, this wave of populism, this wave of, of course, uh, well, uh, uh, misinformation, like United States, France, Italy, we see a large pauperization of middle class and people who struggle economically in the regions that were harder hit uh, by, well, really, uh, this uh, financialization of European uh, economy and, well, the reforms that were um, being introduced post-1980s and especially post-2008 after austerity politics were introduced. My question is, or just, just like an well, open invitation to a question really, is uh, maybe the media is only the mediator of really what's going on. That is, uh, people being disfranchised to an extent that they have the rage that it's not really well assessed, not really uh, well um, dealt with, and that's how they express it. Okay, so you say that the, that the media has a role in regarding? As in that this kind of misinformation, etc., works by people being desperate, by people not having, not having well, mm -hmm. Uh, the quality of life improved and economics so really failing so, them. So the question is, is it, is it really an economic question rather than a media question? I mean, is, it, is, it, is the source of this economic? And that's a, that's a, you know, that's the... To an extent, yeah. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's the, that argument has been going on for several years now, you know, what, what's the source of this? I mean, my, I, I believe that there are, I mean, this is, and this, we're now into a different subject, which is the sources of populism or the sources of anti-establishment sentiment in Western countries. Um, the, the difficulty with saying that it's economic um, is that um, the, the, you know, the, the, the many of the people who are angriest are not the poorest. Um, and many of the countries that are the most disturbed are not the ones that have had the biggest economic trauma. In other words, you can't make it, there is, doesn't seem to be a kind of direct connection between um, having suffered from the 2009 collapse and then having this, I mean, I, I accept that it's a factor and I think the undermining in particular of the Western business and financial establishment that happened in the wake of 2008 and 9 um, 
you know, they were seen as kind of, since 1989, of having some kind of super authority. They could figure everything out. You know, the Washington consensus could fix every country and so on. This was, this was undermined, and this is, this is certainly a piece of the, of the story. Um, nevertheless, if you look at um, who voted for Brexit, for example, it does not track with poverty or economics. Um, you know, if you look at you know, in which countries there's been the hardest far-right backlash. I mean, you know, you, you, you opened by speaking Polish. I mean, the, the country in, in Europe that has been, you know, within its own terms, the most successful economically over 25 years is Poland. I mean, the, there has never been a recession. You know, the, the economy has continued to grow. Living standards are completely different now from what they were before. Mm -hmm. And yet it has had this, you know, there's been a big backlash and a nationalist government in power. So. The, you, I don't think there's a way to make an exact, and, and by the way, many of the people who vote for the nationalist government, again, are not the poorest people. So there, it's very hard to make an exact link between economics and this other problem. So it, it's not it's, an, it's a completely, it's, it's, it's a, it's a factor, problem. and if we were having a wider conversation about populism, which maybe we'll get to, you know, yeah. then we would certainly have to talk about it, and I, it's part of the story, but I don't, I don't, people who try to shrink this problem down to economics, I think, I mean, there's this, we've all had, funnily enough, in the last several decades, this very Marxist way of thinking about politics, you know, that everything is explained by economics, you know, that the job of the prime minister is to increase economic growth, you know, that the point of politics is, you, cannot, you know, we've had this very econo economist-centric yeah. um, view of politics, and I think that's falling apart because people want other things, and, a lot of what's is happening it, now is, is, is to do with identity politics yeah. or, um, or other or cultural issues that somehow weren't, weren't even part of the conversation 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Is it the combination about the economic problems and the cultural problems, pe people searching for cultural identity? So, I mean, the, yeah, I think people want, you know, as I, I kind of alluded to this in, in my talk, the, as traditional sources of identity disappear, you know, trade unions, you know, you know, what was the left until recently? And it was a, it was a political party that emanated from a real life organization, which was the trade union movement. You know, what was the Christian, Dem what was Christian democracy? It was, you know, a political movement that emanated from a real life thing, namely the Catholic church and the, and the, um, and the um, institutions around it, you know, and as those, you know, as those institutions become weaker and people look for different kinds of identities online, then, then the parties break down too. Okay. We have one question uh, over there uh, because there's also... I mean, so, I sorry. we talked just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no. We want to have another question. Maybe you can give the mic to the... Uh, yeah. yeah. Just one question and then we go to the second uh, session. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Frederick. Um, uh, great to hear you in person. I, I really enjoy your columns. Um, so my question is, so if it's not uh, the economics, perhaps maybe it's just the system of the social media that um, creates this dynamic of polarization, of populism, um, of the, the whole revenue model that makes us uh, act like um, st strategic actors because we need to have revenues, we need to, um, you know, get our, um, you know, we, we need to communicate in a way that's polarizing because otherwise it doesn't generate any clicks. Yeah, there's something to that. No, I mean, that's how Facebook works. Right. I mean, that, I mean that's what it is. That, that's what I meant. That's what the algorithm does. You know, the more you, you know, the more popular something is, the more popular it becomes. You know, one of the ways to become popular is to be say something extreme. Uh, yeah. So that's a... Right. That's a known, um, a known phenomenon. Right. Okay. Thank you so. Yeah. It's, uh, thank it's you so definitely. Much. I mean, so I mean, not to get into too many deep into the weeds, but yes, there is a one of the conversations to have eventually is the question of should there be a public service algorithm? So okay, we created public service television, right? We, we created public service radio. That was a, one of our responses to the invention of radio and television. <laughs> in order to keep our societies, whatever, talking about the same thing. Maybe there's an argument for a public service algorithm. Maybe there's a... That would be you know, interesting. Could you rethink, and this is for, for computer scientists and psychologists and political scientists to talk about, is there a way to write an algorithm so that it brings people together instead of dividing them? OK. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Would and also thank you so much for your vision on this uh, subject. Uh, Eric Koster, I would like to go to the second session. Yeah. The Truth of Fiction as Counterpunch to Fake News was hosted by Professor Heinders. Yeah. Uh, what were the highlights? Oh, very interesting, actually, as the day is going on, uh, go going by here. I, I'm starting to um, get into the, the dooms camp, so to speak, because the scope of the problem seems to be so huge. And I think uh, uh, Ms. Heinkes actually, uh, she explained to us that she's looking for manners in which you can train people themselves to start um, uh, recognizing the difference between fake news and, 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 and reality, basically, which is difficult. <laughs> And part of that is by, um, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, by, uh, by, by suggesting that people uh, start reading more, uh, reading novels, because mm -hmm. nowadays, uh, especially current novels and more recent novels, they start using realities and, and, and placing, let's say, the story within a reality uh, of itself, yet the story is, is still uh, a fiction. Uh, which, you know, if you keep doing that and you keep reading those books, uh, you start developing your own way in uh, recognizing what's fake and what's not and trying to, uh, to find that, uh, uh, let's say, a difference between the two. Uh, which, yeah, and of course, there's a, it, they pulled a little trick on us today because they, they asked us, you, can you ask a question during the session? Uh, however, you thought of the question before the session started. So basically, my question has been evolving for the okay. past two hours, <laughs> uh, because you, you answered most of them uh, already. Yeah. It started out basically with a suggestion, uh, should we have an independent agency uh, paid for by the government, of course, uh, yeah. which makes it in itself perhaps not that independent, that already checks news uh, real time, although I also see issues there. So then, yeah, then I we get to censorship pretty fast. Exactly. That's, I, a, that's I, the problem. And yeah. I do have some historical awareness, so I, I do see I some no issues doubt. there, mm -hmm. uh, so which basically makes me rethink my question uh, and you also said that in the end it also boils down to uh, people not want to be fooled. Uh, so it's up to us as a society, as citizens as well. And that's actually basically what you are saying also. You, I think it b would boil down to training people to recognize fake news or not and, and you know, helping them uh, get a willingness. I love the idea of using fiction yeah. to do that. I mean, I hadn't heard that before. but. Um, as a way of talking about what's real and what's not. And because when you read fiction, of course, you suspend some, you know, it depends on the book, obviously, but you suspend some sense of reality and you, you know, you, you follow the story. I mean, I haven't, I haven't, I've, nobody's said that to me before, so I'd love to hear more from, um, from a professor who's trying to teach that. It's really yeah, interesting. Well, maybe the professor yes. <laughs> in pink. is here. Maybe you can give a, a brief reflection uh, on it. Where's the mic? Where's the mic? Oh, yeah, okay, but we also, yeah. Well, the idea um, was exactly as you were saying. So we are used in literary studies, let's say, or in culture studies, we are used to um, uh, what we talk about as the willing suspension of disbelief. When you start reading a novel, you start on page one, you do it till, uh, let's say, page 300, and you recognize this is a world as such, a reality as such. I do know that it is not the real reality, but I prepare myself to believe in it as long as I'm reading. Okay. Sorry that I'm um, with my back to the audience. No, 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 it's no problem. I, um, we understand. And then what we talked about, and there's, there are some really interesting um, uh, novels that have disappeared uh, lately. For instance, we talked about Huvelle Beck in France, and we talked about Erpenbeck in, uh, in Germany. And they are using, in their uh, novel reality, in the literary reality, uh, very much historical figures or things that are going on in, in real society as well. So then, as a reader, you have to be aware, okay, this is uh, the willing suspension of disbelief. I do not really believe it, but uh, for, the fake, for the sake of the reading, I, I believe in it. But I also can make links to what is happening outside, uh, in the real world. So the point was, that was the argument of the session, uh, when you are trained in reading this type of novels, you are sort of... Um, uh, more streetwise when it comes to fake yeah, news? Yeah, more streetwise, but also <laughs> more capable of seeing, okay, this is a rhetoric part mm -hmm. for, uh, connected to the fakeness. This is something that I see yeah. in reality. Um, and you know that you have to jump, maybe, or make the okay. connections between the two. It's a very interesting uh, idea. Well, uh, no, it's fascinating. I mean, I, 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 it's fascinating. I mean, a lot of the people who are studying this subject are people who have in the past been interested in kind of 
what are postmodernist ideas about literary criticism, you know. Um, so it would be interesting to try and, cure, I mean, in a way this, uh, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, the idea of the proliferation of narratives and trying to figure out what's true and what's false is something that, um, you know, what a wonderful idea that you could cure it by going back to literature and thinking in a literary way. I mean, um, so, yeah, it's a great idea. Is there someone else who wants to reflect on this uh, subject? Yeah, there's someone here and someone over there. We start off over there. Please stand up, then, then the mic, other side. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. A briefly introduction and then your question or remark, please. My name is Karel. Um, I'm still in middle school, so I'm really pleased that I can be here because uh, yeah, this is a lot more interesting than my math class. <laughs> 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 Um, this might not really fit in this subject, but um, the last years we saw a, a big rise in alt-right and alt-left. Um, and, you know, they, they are really convinced that they are on the right side. Um, and in my opinion, the only way we can improve our con country is um, by working together. Um, so do you see it uh, as a threat that, um, you know, uh, our society is starting to get so uh, polarized. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yes, I, th I think the, the, you know, the root of the fake news problem is this problem of polarization, and that polarization is the real problem. It's the deeper, it's the deeper issue. Um, it's not just about fake stuff online. It's, a, it's, the, it's the impact of it. And so then the question is, um, what are the anti? What are the politics of anti-polarization look like? You know, who are the figures? What are the issues? Can you get people to work together? Um, so, lots of people are doing different kinds of thinking about it. In the United States, there is a charity or a sort of NGO, a, an organization called Better Angels, um, and it takes the name from a famous speech given by Abraham Lincoln. Um, who, who talked about the better angels of our nature, meaning the better things, this is at the time of the American Civil War, are the things that link us together. Um, and Better Angels is a group you can read about that, that, um, that looks, that seeks out people, um, they actually call them blues and reds, you know, people who are conservatives and liberals in America, and they, they have a, a kind of program where they bring people together and make them talk. Mm -hmm. um, and the point is not for each side to convince one another of their, you know, it, it's assumed that nobody will win the argument. The, the point is not to argue, the point is to come up with constructive projects they can do together, to think about what, what it is about the American system they both admire, what, you know, what is yeah. the constitutional traditions that both support them. And it's a, it's a, it sounds a bit um, kind of mushy, um, when I heard it first yeah, described yeah. to me, I thought, ugh, you know, <laughs> that doesn't Sweet sound talk. too nice, you know, yeah. doesn't sound like it. However, I have to say, I, have an, um, I know several people who are part of starting this movement, and it is, it, is, it, it, it is taking off with this amazing speed, and there are now dozens and dozens of these groups all over the country who are meeting and having these conversations. I have no idea whether, and maybe actually in a smaller country, you might achieve more with that, but I mean, Thinking about how, you know, very, for example, in, the, in, in studying what keeps people apart, it's almost always the case that um, people will say th harsh things about one another online that they would never say in real life. You know, when you're sitting next to a real person, yeah. you have a different kind of conversation than you have with somebody, you know, on Twitter. Um, and so the idea of this organization was can we bring people together and have real conversations and therefore have a more civilized conversation and not just s scream at each other and trade insults online. Thank you. Uh, another question, uh, yeah, can you please stand up? Then the mic can, okay, maybe you can uh, help us out. Yeah, maybe you can <laughs> give him that. It's a big room. Thank you. Uh, my name is Wiel Hoefnagels. I have a very uh, popular profession. I'm a banker in a French bank in the service of compliance in Brussels. And uh, my question is, in the 70s, uh, there was some clearly fake news. And I asked my father, what can I do so that I don't read the wrong things? And then he said, I bought three newspapers. And indeed, he always bought 
a left newspaper, a right-wing newspaper, and a local newspaper. Of course, not the companies of the newspapers, as you suggest, but uh, <laughs> just the newspaper. And uh, my question to you is, what do you tell your children? You've got two kids. Uh, how to weapon them and to make this, to distinguish disinformation, information, fake news, and truth. Yeah, that's my Beautiful question. Beautiful personal question. Thank you. So that's an interesting question. So um, my children, I mean, maybe this will be true of everybody. My children are one of the things that make me quite hopeful, not because they're so great, um, but because, <laughs> although of course they are, <laughs> but but they are. Um, they are very savvy about what they read online. You know, they're, you know, they're people, they grew up reading everything online. They never read paper newspapers. So, you know, this, you know, they're, they're absolutely used to this world. Um, they are, you know, they, they, they pay a lot of attention to where things come from. You know, they, they compare and contrast. They look for things that they think have good sources and, and not. So, I mean, in a way, I'm wondering if some of this conversation isn't about just people in their 40s and 50s, and mm -hmm. whereas actually people who are much younger are going to figure this stuff out pretty quickly. You know, the, the, you because know, they're, they're raised and they're raised with it. They, you know, they get it. They, um, they, you know, they don't need it explained to them. And they, they, you know, they've all personally experienced, I don't know whether it's either being bullied online or seeing fake stories about their friends, you know, some of it, they've already had these, you know, experiences with false stories online, you know, in a personal sense. Um, I also find that they and all of their friends, amazingly, um, are incredibly skeptical of social media. Um, they don't have Facebook pages. They, I mean, they are, you know, they're very wary about what they put online. They know about privacy. You know, they know that the, the social media yeah. companies are using their information. So I find they're quite, um, you know, they're, they're more savvy about it in some ways than, um, than older people. But, you know, yeah, of course, I, I, you know, we've always had, you know, multiple news sources, and we've always tried to look at lots of things, and we always tried to tell them to do that too. But I, I almost think they do it. That generation does it automatically. Okay. Thank you uh, so much for the question. We are going to head on to Russia uh, because you yeah. were at the session, uh, Russia and the West from Cold War to Cyber War, uh, was hosted by Professor Randall Lesaffer, if I, I, something like it. <laughs> okay, maybe you can reflect what, what were the highlights during the session and also your question. Well, I, I think um, the, the highlights was, we, well, uh, uh, the, the workshop focused very much on the relationship with, uh, with Russia. Um, and uh, there was a kind of uh, implicit assumption in, in, in the room, and uh, maybe I exaggerate a little bit, but that we are the good guys and Russia, uh, well, they are the bad guys. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, uh, well, um, maybe there's some room to challenge uh, that. Um, and then maybe I can go over to uh, your lecture, uh, because um, actually uh, you started with um, a kind of description what happened in the, in, the, in the cyber world, and actually it seems that we have been subject to a kind of Russian cyber rage over the last uh, years. Uh, I think even you can call it a cyber war from the side of, of Russia. And the interesting question is what's behind uh, that? And mm -hmm. you mentioned it's the fear for democracy. And then uh, hey, uh, you mentioned that uh, for a few years the relationship with Russia was okay until a uh, democratic movement started in Russia and uh, in the Arab uh, Arabic Spring time. Uh, so that caused a, a huge race uh, from, from Russia. So the question is, um, isn't our uh, is it, it isn't it our assumption that uh, democracy is the best systems for all nations, and that our push towards Russia uh, with regard to uh, democracy causes all the problems with Russia, and um, could pushing less maybe improve the relationship with Russia, and even uh, create a kind of collaboration in the cyber world? Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice idea. I mean, the only problem with that thesis is that it leaves out the Russians. Um, and the, the, the Russian um, democratic opposition, which, I mean, I wish that the CIA was clever enough to have created it, um, mm -hmm. but I don't think, unfortunately, that it's true. Um, and so most of the, 
the, you know, the, 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 the pro-democracy movement in Russia, such as it is, or even sometimes I think pro-democracy is the wrong way, pro-justice or pro, um, you know, pro-fairness in some ways. I mean, most of that is coming from inside Russia. So it is not us pushing democracy in Russia. It's coming, you know, from, from people there. Um, and I'd also say I think it's, I think it's true that, the, um, that Putin's, you know, animus towards the West does, it dates from both the 2011-12 demonstrations in, in Moscow and, and elsewhere, and also from the democratic revolution in Ukraine. Um, but it's also, um, you know, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a deeper issue, which is that he, you know, in the first 10 years when he was in power, um, his essential, I and mean, I'm kind of exaggerating to make a point, but I mean, his essential message to Russians was, okay, I'm corrupt, you know, lots, you know, um, and the system isn't fair, but at least you're all getting richer, you know, and at least we now have stability. And that was actually a very successful political message and it lasted for 10 years and, and he, he had, I think, real legitimacy just with that message. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is now that Russia is not getting richer um, and the, the, the glaring unfairnesses of the society are bothering people more. And so there have been, it's not just kind of intellectuals in Moscow, there have also been different kinds of demonstrations and strikes against even things like pension reform all over the country. Um, and this makes um, the Kremlin very nervous. Um, and so part of what the, you know, the other thing that they're doing now is that the, now the message is, okay, you know, I'm corrupt and okay, the economy is not going that well, but at least I'm making Russia great again. Um, and so at least I, you know, now Russia is a big player in the Middle East and look how seriously, you know, and, and we're winning the war, you know, and we're, we're winning the war against the EU and, you know, our guys on the far right are going to take down European institutions and, you know, so, so, so we're winning. So there's a, there's a way in which it's almost a kind of militarized rhetoric that's, that's, that, that is now the basis of Putin's legitimacy. I mean, Putin knows he's not democratically elected. You know, he knows the system is rigged. Yeah. He, you know, he, you know, it's not like he, it's not like he's not like he's mystified by that. Therefore, what, but, but he does worry, like all autocrats worry, about legitimacy and about staying in power. And so this, this now, I think, is one of the ways in which they stay in power is to constantly denigrate and undermine, both in their own country and abroad, um, European and Western institutions to make sure that, you know, Russians don't think those are better and also to make, mm -hmm. to make them look better. I mean, that's, sorry, that's a long answer. But, but what, what do you think that the, the, the attraction of all the strong leaders we see, eh? we see Erdogan, we see uh, Trump, we see Orban, um, uh, different leaders, strong leaders, um, what's the attraction? Well, I mean, uh, throughout human history, people have been attracted to strong leaders. I mean, look, democracy is the exception. You know, the, this, this little liberal democratic moment that we live in um, is exceptional in human history. I mean, there aren't that many um, examples of democracies that last for, you know, mm -hmm. even, for, even for many decades, let alone, you know, centuries. So, you know, the, in, a, in a way, the default human position is authoritarianism of some yeah. kind, whether, you know, as monarchs or you know, it's taken different forms in the past than it does now. But is it also but, uh, the real problem that we were, uh, um, that we're being arrogant about the liberal democracy all these years? I don't think we've been arrogant. I think we've been complacent. I mean, I think we, you know, we began to assume, you know, we began to assume it would always be that way because it has been this way actually for an amazingly long time. I yeah, mean, so we've been since the lazy. Second World War. So I mean, I think probably if we were having this conversation in 1948, um, we wouldn't be so complacent. People would be very nervous about liberal democracy. Will it survive? Will we? Will we be taken over by the Soviet Union? Mm -hmm. Will you know? Uh, so there was a, there was a lot of anxiety about it, and people worried about it. And you know, I don't. You know, now we've had since really since 1945. You know, we've had however many decades, that is, of democracy and really democracy and prosperity the whole time, although, you know, it goes up and down a little bit. Um, and we are complacent. We just assume it will, it all has to be like this just because, you know, it has been for six decades. Yeah. How many decades? Seven decades. Yeah. Yeah. Our last uh, session, uh, the session, the battle for truth, rationalization, unease and trust in science, uh, hosted by Professor Achterberg, uh, Bauke Dynema. Yes, thank you very much. Um, the session was um, about science and about fragmentation in science um, and about people 
not believing science and start to create their own truth. Um, and we focused on Peter's own research on four subjects. Uh, one being the Flat Earth Society, people believing that the Earth is not round but flat. Um, and for instance, uh, people who believe in conspiracy theories. Um, and I think this uh, lecture by you um, really complements it pretty well because it's about what do we believe and what do we believe is true. Do we believe uh, science because it's based on facts uh, and statistics? Uh, or do we believe on politicians who hopefully have done their research well? Um, but not always. Not always, no, of course. <laughs> Um, but one question we uh, talked about briefly in the session was uh, about whether uh, all science is based on an opinion. Uh, and then I tried to, um, to make a bridge with uh, your talk. Uh, so my question was, because people like Trump are really making the distinction clear between uh, fake news and then something that's probably real news or true news, uh, is that something that's... Um, it can be captured, and is there something like, I don't know if that's a term already, but like a journalism paradox, in which a journalist tries to be a fly on the wall and tries to capture everything as good as possible, but always fails in that because every uh, question is very, um, very hard and very um, complicated, so that uh, the real, true uh, news can never be met, because every news company is, of course, owned by someone who um, has been educated or has a social cultural background that is not well, the yeah, same I mean, across everyone. I mean, there's sort of there's several different questions in there, but you know, is mm -hmm. is the question of, you know, is everybody coming from some perspective, you know, and does everybody share some bias? Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, of course they do. Um, the question is whether it's a, you know, it, you know, whether it's a bias that serves the purposes of you know, liberal democracy and public debate, or whether it's a bias that serves a different set of purposes. I mean, that, you know, I mean, the idea that there's some kind of perfect news is, of course, wrong. Um, and I'm always very careful when I talk about that, you know, ob objectivity is a goal. You know, it's a thing people try for. It's not something anybody ever achieves. I mean, nobody is, there is no perfectly objective writer, you know. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, so I think we just have to, you know, think about which biases are most useful to our society mm. and which, which, which are less so. I mean, the question of scientific information is actually really interesting. Um, I know that a lot of people who study conspiracy theories and who study disinformation have spent a lot of time studying the vaccine conspiracies, because these are, of course, apolitical. You know, it's nothing to do with, yeah. what, you know, um, although, just as a little aside, apparently the Russians push that too, yeah. I know. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, um, partly because they've worked out that it create you know it creates uncertainty about the medical establishment yeah. and then uncertainty about you know then the medical establishment for a lot of people is a metaphor for social yeah. institutions and so on. So also President Trump uh, is against vaccines. Uh, He's been very quiet about that actually. Yes, yeah, so sometimes I think it may be Melania, but I'm not yeah. sure. Anyway, yeah. Um, um, they have some problems with one of their sons yeah. with their son, um, but. Um, but yeah, it's um, so it's a it's an it's an interesting problem. I mean, it's one you can study it in a purer way than you can study political disinformation, um, and and of course the interesting thing about it is that the people who believe the conspiracies, if you give them scientific journals like you know the really good top scientific journals, they will use those journals and critique them and go on with the conspiracy. In other words, giving people the journal doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. I mean, so this is one of the most famous examples of how, you know, factual information, when you give it to, I mean, literally, yeah. hand it to people, they don't, they what don't believe it. What does that tell you? Uh, sorry? What does that tell you? It, that it, it works tells you that the, the basis of trust and belief lies somewhere else. Um, and, I mean, it may turn out there are some people who you can never convince. Um, it may be that you have to reach people in some different way. You may have to get them, you know, maybe their neighbor has to approach them and say, I had my child vaccine, you know, or you, they may have to see people dying from measles before they, I mean, there may be some other, you may have to have some other means of reaching them other than just giving them a scientific journal. Uh, other questions, yes, the lady in the back of the room, please stand up, then they come with the microphone and they can see you, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Martina Janowicz, also Polish citizen and a Dutch citi citizen. 
Um, I'm coming a bit from a more positivist uh, background than uh, maybe the student, sorry, I, I, I forgot your name. I do believe there are facts, though we might vary in how we interpret them. No, no, I think there are facts. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> if we agree on that, um, I was thinking, you know, how in, um, in science, how do we, because we were talking about the problem that different sources provide different kinds of facts. So, you know, how do we deal with that in science? Through triangulation, through meta-analysis of a sort. So I was kind of playing with an idea, what if, you know, like grocery stores have sort of a label for how healthy a food is, if we had some kind of seal. An index. Index, indeed. That would, it's been thought of, yeah. That shows to what extent there's overlap in how facts are presented in media across the spectrum. And then you could have, you know, if a fact is covered in a similar way by 90%, that would be great. 70, you know, still okay, but you could have a bit of a idea, where do you stand? What are your thoughts about yeah, no, no, that? I mean, there, there have been a number of ideas like that, that may, somebody I know has been working for a long time actually trying to create an index um, that would, for example, rank websites on the internet and give them sort of check marks, you know, or stars or something, you know, depending on how, how you know, you can imagine what the blowback to this would look like, but giving them, um, you know, reliability, some kind of reliability index. Um, and then you could base it on, you could even do it in a computerized way, you know, it based on, you could have a list of 30 different kind of criteria. Is the website registered in a transparent way or something? I mean, so there, there was a, um, there have been several people who've been thinking about, could you do something like that? Could you give a ranking? Could you give a, and then people can decide, right? I mean, you can decide to look at the low ranked website and make up your own mind, just like you can, you know, they give calorie counts on the back of cookie, you know, cake um, things that you buy in the supermarket. And you can just, you can look at it and say, right, I don't care. I don't care if it has, I can eat it anyway. Mm -hmm. And you could decide that about the website. So I don't care, I know this has a low ranking and I, you know. I mean, it's a little tricky because then the question would be who's doing the rankings? Um, and you can imagine, okay. And can they be hacked or yeah. and can they be attacked or, you know, and uh, there was an idea to create a kind of consortium of universities to, to do this. It might have, it might happen. Um, but okay. it, it's a, there are a lot of, a lot of both technical and sort of philosophical things to think through. But there are people who are thinking about that. Okay. It's a good idea. I have uh, room for two final questions. The lady over here, please stand up. <laughs> and then you have the final question. Yeah. Oh, my name is Cecilia van Pesky, and I studied psychology here at the university many years ago. And I learned back then as a psychologist that we only know really what our own habitat is once we are outside of that habitat, right? It was a, a metaphor with the water, like the fish is, when the fish is outside of the fish tank, then he only knows what water is. Almost a little bit like the Higgs uh, particles, I would say. But uh, I think what I find very in interesting about the discussion, and I was in a group uh, talking about e um, EU-Russian relations, uh, is um, and, and we are not really fully touching, uh, touching upon that, but I know we are limited in time, the root causes of this. Uh, because I do think that, um, and I spent three years in Donetsk in the conflict uh, that we have just presently, oh, we actually are still in, uh, for the work for the OSCE. And, um, and the only question I basically got every time when I was in the Netherlands, having my break here in Tilburg, having a little R&R, uh, &R, was did you see these uh, Russian green men? It was literally the only question I ever got because that was the view that we had in the West and that was what we wanted to have the answer of. Nobody asked me, ever, nobody ever asked me uh, who is shelling your compound at night? And that came from the West, that came from Ukrainian territory. Nobody was interested in this fact. And I, I just want to emphasize again, we, we really don't know what we are facing at this stage. Also with this information, this information. I, although I agree that there are facts, it's not a black and white world. And I think especially that is what these children already know. They know it's not just a black and white world because they also didn't grow up in that black and white world. Mm -hmm. We still did, you know, we still did in the 70s. Yeah. I just want to keep that uh, in mind for further discussion. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you so much. The final question was over there. Um, yeah, at the other side. <laughs> Sorry, we have to wait for the microphone. Uh, yeah, you're running. <laughs> 
our final question uh, before we round it up. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Richard Court. In fact, Maybe the, the microphone, microphone can be uh, a little bit higher. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will not spoil uh, too much of your time. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe I've missed a scenario in your lecture because you uh, told about the story of the tap water for us being automatic, uh, you know, uh, yeah. uh, something we know. But um, what about electricity being, uh, uh, in fact, the generator of disinformation or information? What if uh, we run into a third world war and um, you're an historian? So um, you must, I think you know the, the theory that uh, every now and then, every decade, we run into a war. And in fact, I myself believe we are somewhere in 1935 preparing and rearming, in fact, for a war. And in fact, for a world we don't know. So in fact, when, uh, when there's a major disaster of a nuclear bomb exploding, mm -hmm. uh, no electricity uh, being, only uh, the time that your cell phone lasts on the battery, that would at least, in theoretical sense, solve your in, uh, problem of disinformation. Right, so, right, if there's also no the internet, internet, then no everything's information. fine. Yes, <laughs> indeed, indeed. But I, I think that somewhere that scenario <laughs> is realistic in the coming few years. And the, the change and the, the parallel, in fact, with the, for, with the uh, former two world wars is that those people of those generations my uh, grandparents, in fact, yeah. are still used to survive in a world like that. We, uh, okay. us, and, and, and do you have do yes. you have a question regarding this? Or in fact, I, I'm missing that parallel in your uh, analysis. Okay. What would happen? Maybe Anne can reflect on your uh, view. Yeah. I mean, no, it's true. I didn't. I wasn't talking about what would happen after nuclear war. I mean, um, <laughs> I wasn't thinking about it. No, but actually, your deep, your your deeper point, you know, um, uh, you know, are you know, w w should shouldn't we include the possibility of even more radical things happening and more profound disturbances? Um, is right. I mean, yes, we we have assumed for a long time that everything will just go on the way it has because it has just because it has for a long time and. Um, we have forgotten that, you know, we have not abolished nuclear war, we have not abolished, um, you know, other kinds of weapons, we have not abolished um, dictatorship, we have not abolished um, warfare, and all of those things are possible again. Yes, but in fact, we would rely back on traditional media. Uh, sorry? Pen and, we would rely back on traditional media, writing things down and pen well, paper think, cash money. I think okay. traditional we media also needs like Thank you, thank you, yeah. thank you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, no, I was st it. saying thank you to him. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think in the circumstances of there being a nuclear war, there would be other issues as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but no, I'm sorry, I'm, not, I'm sorry, okay. I'm, I'm trying to, no. there would also be, we would maybe, also have trouble with newspapers. Maybe, I mean, uh, and your final call to action for the audience. Um, so everyone get out and tweet something. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe stop with Twitter and Facebook. Or stop tweeting. <laughs> yeah, give her a big round of applause. Um, and we are so great that you were here today. And uh, there's also, um, we have a little present for you. Please, Nina, you can uh, bring it to uh, Anne. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. I really and appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Another big round of applause, please. <laughs> Thanks. And also for the panel members, we have a, a little present. Uh, it's uh, your book called The Red Famine. Oh, a wonderful nice. souvenir from, from a fantastic day. Uh, what's the parallel with Not this sure. book regarding uh, the topic we are discussing today? So that would require another hour conversation. No, <laughs> but, uh, no th th this, is a, this is a book, it's a very different subject. It's about um, an atrocity that took place in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, the Ukrainian famine. Um, in my head it is linked, um, and the link is, is to do with the, um, you know, the use of dehumanizing language and hate speech. I mean, the, you know, why was the famine possible? Ultimately, it was possible because 
Stalin po successfully polarized the Soviet population and he convinced some people that others, you know, didn't deserve to not just not to be citizens but not to live and that was that that was that's that's how this particular dictatorship worked. So um, it's a it's a longer conversation. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you also so much for the panel members. Thank you for all the opinions in the room. If you're depressed about the future, the drinks now are ready, just like uh, you already said, and then we have an optimistic uh, <laughs> way of ending this uh, day. Uh, please, a big round of applause for you and also for the panel members and for Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.